All right. We're getting things uh, booted up here just because it's been such a, a crazy day, really. I mean, a crazy week uh, and a crazy day. Um, I mean, I'll just say it right here. I mean, we saw HBAR um, really see some interesting, we saw some interesting price action on that um, today. Uh, and we don't really know what it was about. Um there's a lot of speculation into kind of what it could be. And to be honest with you, um, I don't really know what could have been the reason for sure. I mean, I have a lot of ideas and we'll talk about that on the show, but when it comes to actually having an idea of what happened um, with the show or sorry, not with the show. Sorry. I was, I was reading, I was reading some comments coming in. Um, some folks listening, uh, Andre's shout out says, uh, hi guys, greeting from, from the uh, Latino community in Colombia. Shout out to you guys. Um, mid 99% says for the W feels like that a bit, you know, big W today. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to see a big retracement on H bar, but, uh, yeah, we saw a big move. Let me load up uh coin market cap, um, right now. And we'll just take a quick, take a quick peek here. But yeah, what is the current price of H bar? Got my key. I've got my keyboard all like in a weird position. I'm a mess today. The the news has me too excited today. It's been a while since we've had a little bit of a crazy move on H bar. But there's some other interesting aspects to this I want to touch on. Um, and again, we'll talk about this on the show for sure. But I mean, just off the top. I've been waiting to talk about this with all you guys. Um, almost hit six cents. I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot when you put it into the big the big picture. I mean, we were at uh, eight and a half cents at the beginning of the year, um, and we've had an all time high of about forty seven cents. So, I mean, put it into context. Six cents isn't anything to like be jumping up and down about in the big picture, but considering right that over the last i'd say month at least let me take a look here what was the last time we hit six cents the last time we hit six cents was just the beginning of may not even not even that the end of april and that was it so we haven't hit six cents since then and that's i think why people are excited right is it's been a it's been a long journey at under six cents. So today, what we saw, what, what I saw when I woke up was um, at about 9 p.m. last night, my time, right, Eastern, um, it was at 5.2 cents, right? And then we had a ride up to 5.93 cents. So again, in the big scheme of things, this is just a little tiny blip on the radar. But if you look over the last two or three months, you can understand kind of how this is a, a bit of a substantial move. Um, again, considering that we didn't see a big jump up in Bitcoin and, and some of these other assets, it was, it was really, I think also too, a lot of the liquidity people said it was mostly the um, H bar USDT pair on Binance, if that's uh, helpful to anybody. But the main thing I want to talk about, um, just before we dive into it, is the fact that Hedera's market cap um, yesterday, of which was about $1.7 billion, is approaching $2 billion. Um, and as we know, that's another kind of element to this is the market cap for Hedera. If we look back again at the big picture, we've seen Hedera with a market cap of... Uh, $6.5 billion, right? Again, at all time highs. Uh, and the last time we were at a $2 billion market cap, right? Again, that would have been just the end. Or actually, no, hold on. The last time we were at a $2 billion market cap was April 18th, right? So again, these are kind of Two big numbers, right? Six cents and the and the two billion dollar market cap. But also, 
Um, over the last 24 hours, we've seen a 315% increase in volume. And that's really important because you can have price, but then you can also have volume. And when there's a, when there's very little volume behind a move in price, you know, there's nothing really driving that move in price. You could call that, you know, a blip or a side effect of something. But when you have this much volume driving a move like this, that makes it, that does make it interesting at the very least. Um, so we're sitting at almost $120 million volume. And um, just to wrap up on just kind of this point on the H bar price, <clears throat> in regards to market cap, we are at number 30 on coin market cap. And as we've known, um, the market cap ranking on coin market cap is one of the number one things that the HBAR Foundation tracks in regards to network growth. That's what Shane, the CEO of the HBAR Foundation, um, mentioned on a recent interview. So lots of things kind of happening just from a price standpoint just today. Um, and if this was kind of out of the blue, it wouldn't really be that. It, I mean, it would be interesting, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, demand this much attention. It would just kind of be exciting. But because there's been so much news um, and so many changes to how Hedera actually works, which we'll talk about as well, that aspect really makes it interesting because there is quite a few things you can point to as being catalysts for this move. And also there's things we can speculate on in regards to things that may have happened that we don't know about that could drive a move like this, right? drive this 11%, 12% increase on the day. Um, and with that, we're live on Twitter Spaces. HBAR is at 5.8 cents. It's 7.05 p.m. Eastern on Sunday. Uh, and yeah, guys, it's it's a vibe today. I'm feeling good. I'm super excited about this episode. I don't have a guest. I don't think we would have had time. Our last episode was two and a half hours. So shout out to anyone who watched that whole episode but i will say last episode 85 was probably one of my favorite episodes that i did because i got to interview carmel cadet who is the ceo of em tech we talked about cbdc's and the kind of change in perspective around them and a lot of things that i didn't understand it's probably one of the interviews i've learned the most from so if you're interested go back and listen to that show but what's going on uh this week uh, so we're going to be talking about the, of course, the Hyundai Motor Group joining forces, including Kia, with Hedera for a new supplier CO2 emission monitoring system. Uh, that's huge news. And again, you know, when we talk about things that could be driving price action, who knows? Um, Hedera has made a substantial change to the staking algorithm that's driven a lot of debate and conversation in the community. We're going to talk about that. FSCO, Fresh Supply Company, I've had the uh, the CEO, David, as a guest on the show uh, previously. I hope to have him again. I mean, it would be a blast. But this use case has gone live, and there's an interesting angle to it, which is it involves MasterCard, which I'm going to talk about. Um, there's been substantial changes to how NFT fees are defined on Hedera that will have all sorts of implications. We'll talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about account 0.0.800. That's the account that staking rewards are pulled from for the network. So when you have your HBAR in your wallet and you're getting staking rewards, that's the account that those rewards are coming from. Well, What's going on with the HBAR in that account? It's jumped from 20 million to over 40 million. We're going to talk about that. We've got a new HIP, right? A Hedera improvement proposal from IBM and Boeing, two governing council members on Hedera. Um, lots to talk about on that. Uh, Lehman and Mance did an interview recently on the HBAR Bulls show. I watched that at least twice. Um, I mean, there's a part of me that's I'll save my thoughts. I'll save my thoughts for the for the rest of the show. We'll 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 chat on it. Hedera also has a new chief open source officer. Uh we got some music updates. I mean the Hedera music scene is starting to make some noise. Um we got we're gonna talk about saucer swap, we're gonna talk about algorithm, we're gonna talk about some exchange things. We got a lock. We there's a lot going on. Let's just dive into it. And with that, 
Good evening from Ottawa, Canada, everyone. My name's Brandon Davenport, a.k.a. It's Brandon D. It is, like I said, Sunday, August 6th, and you're listening to Hashgraph Enthusiast News and Rumors, episode 86, Millions and Billions, uh, a weekly show where we cover the top stories related to Hedera, HBAR, and everything in between. Listen live on Twitter Spaces every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other platforms to hear past episodes. Get all the info you need about the show at itsbrandond.com slash hbar. And for folks listening live now, check out the News and Rumors mega thread pinned to the top of the Jumbotron or whatever we're, we're uh, talking about. And I keep saying Twitter spaces too. I have to, I'm going to try to, I guess this is called X, X spaces. X spaces. Um, and on these X spaces at the top, you can see the the thread um, where you can see all the stories we're going to talk about. Also, take a moment, share this X spaces with your friends. And if you got some interesting news people should know about, click the comment button at the bottom right. Maybe share a photo of where you're listening from. I'm drinking a, a non-alcoholic mojito from a brand that I, that I enjoy. Um from my uh, local supermarket. It's delicious. Um, and <clears throat> for folks listening to the recording, leave a comment and break down your thoughts on what we talk about today. Let's keep the conversation going. Like I said, share the spaces, the more the merrier. We're going to dive into it. And I want to dive into something juicy, but <clears throat> because we have so many heavy hitting stories to talk about, I wanted to get a couple things done off the top to warm us up a little bit, you know what I mean? The first thing I want to talk about is just, I want to, in it, again, such a crazy week. I want to shake it off. It's Sunday. I'm vibing. It's a long weekend here in Canada. I don't know if it is in the U.S., but I want to talk about music on Hedera for two reasons. One reason is that a lot of people in the ecosystem talk about the need to onboard people to... Hedera, right? That's what we need. Hedera is in desperate need of growing users, growing liquidity. Um, I think the NFT ecosystem is is feeling the pain. A lot of builders that I talk to and creators and artists, it's tough out there, right? The general impression from the outside in is, damn, you know, not a lot's happening. There's not a lot of money out there. But the reality is, is that behind the scenes, especially with a lot of people that I talk to in the Hedera community, it's it's crazier than I've ever seen it. Um, I'm I'm consistently shocked by kind of the 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 level of collaboration um, and all of the different things that are happening behind the scenes. It's exciting, like, and it's been that way. I would say since the beginning of the year, like once we were really deep into the bear. Um, and things kind of set in. I think there was a realization that the 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 goal would just to be to survive and really focus on the most important aspects of the network. Um, and so behind the scenes, it's been incredible. But on that, when it comes to music, how it relates to music is when we want adoption and you look at technologies of the past, very often, and I, and I, I wrote about this in a, on a blog on the Hedera blog, I, ha I wrote an article about um, a music NFT that I helped uh, work on with my business partner Joshua Dirks, and we uh, he he wrote a hash shanty, um, and we minted it last summer. Kind of as like, hey, music is a thing. We're gonna make it happen. It's multi-file NFTs. It's beautiful, right? And I wrote on the Hedera blog, and basically, most of the time when you have a new technology. Adoption is driven by artists, right? Art is often something that leads the way. And we saw that with NFTs in general, of course. But if we look at art, a lot of people say to me like, oh, it's oversaturated or it's never going to be as big as it was or NFTs aren't just art. There are all sorts of other utilities like um, the carbon offset stuff, all these different types of things, right? The, the, art, the art thing's kind of overplayed, people are saying. The reality is, is that not only do I think that we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to art with NFTs, the really thing that shocks people, I think, 
when they when they realize it is half of the artwork that you consume in the real world is music right think about that and, and we can't live without music everyone needs music and i would safely say under five or maybe even three percent of the artwork that we consume on uh, in web3 right in the nft ecosystems on every chain is music right a very small amount and so What's the reason behind that? Well, the reason behind that is, is 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 the same issue we saw in Hedera with NFTs in general is a lack of standards. If everyone's trying to do really exciting things in their own way, it's really difficult for wallets, um, marketplaces, dApps to take those creations and build those experiences around them, right? Like an audio player in your wallet, right? Or a 3D object spinning around in a marketplace. Everyone has to be building their NFTs the same way, and that needs standards. And the problem is with music, um, music has so much information inside of it. And so metadata standards are a huge part of that. And so when we look at adoption of the network and people coming over, I think music's going to be a big, big part of that. Not only because... NFT, you know, music NFTs are, are, are seeing a lot of excitement in general, more so because Hedera as a technology, right? Hashgraph as a technology more closely aligns with the music community in general, more so than any other network out there, right? Hedera is low fixed fees. It's carbon negative, all these great things that align the music with the music community. I often say to artists, it's like, you literally just need a few dollars to start your NFT collection on Hedera. That's it, and it's and that's just a crazy fact. But that's the way that it is. And so that's we that's reason one, right? Is reason one is music is a potential tip of the spear for retail, right? If supply chain use cases are the tip of the spear for enterprise, like we're seeing with Hedera, and, and that's really gained traction. I think that when it comes to retail, music has a great chance of not only capturing the attention of fans, but also the attention of artists and labels because the underlying technology aligns so well with that industry. And with new things like HIP uh, 657, right? Dynamic NFTs, music metadata standards, that's just going to create all new pathways for that kind of thing to happen. So that's, that's, that's reason one I'm so excited about this. Reason two is that things are already happening that are really exciting that I don't want people to miss out on, right? Because it, it's a it's a really special moment. Um, a great example again is uh, the Hash Shanty NFT, right? That was released last year. But this year specifically, I'll mention a couple of things. Um, we had uh, Vasizi, right? Vicente in the NFT community in Hedera put out NFTs, um, integrate existing artists from the music industry into the Hedera NFT community, form some bonds there. Um, we had... Patch, uh, patches uh, from Turtle Moon, right? CEO of Turtle Moon, release a music NFT on on uh, the Turtle Moon launch pad. And that incorporated a lot of these aspects of these new working music metadata standards that allows that NFT to do all sorts of special specific music things. Um, there was just recently on August 3rd, um, a Metaverse concert with a Grammy nominated independent artist, uh, Nikki Flores, in the Liftoff, which is a metaverse music venue, um, and this was again in partnership with Vasizi and and uh, and um, uh, Turtle Moon, or, uh, yeah, and, and Turtle Moon, and basically um, that was a concert, right? That had people going there, that had people watching a live broadcast performance of an artist. It's so the music community is happening on Hedera, not because we have standards or, or we're getting standards, we're building standards, or we're starting to see music NFTs. It's because we finally have both happening, right? And that's really why I'm feeling super excited about music on Hedera is because we finally have both pieces working now, which is required in any artistic medium, which is like, I can't even express how exciting it is because if you're talking about getting a regular person excited about this type of technology. Music is something that just connects us all. And then the last thing is, I actually have a music NFT that I've done with my creative firm, Dirksen and Davenport Incorporated, with my business partner, Joshua. It's a H-Bar Anthem, Hello Future. Um, it's a vibe. 
it's a it's a music nft it again takes these music these working music standards even further and there's a hashgraph nft uh working group that works on these music standards anyways it's a big vibe um and check it out i mean the, the info for that is in the uh in the thread pins the top i don't want to plug it too hard but i just wanted i I wanted to mention it, and also too, just before we move on, if anybody in the ecosystem is doing something cool with music, reach out to me um, and reach out to each other because um, really right now the rules for music are being set on Hedera by creators, and that's really exciting. So, and I mean also too, like we've got Seeky, we've got Tune FM, um, we've got, I think uh, Elizabeth from Hello Future, or Hello Future Buzz just put out a track. So it's like, there's songs happening, right? Illuminati Congo is another person doing music on Hedera. Like we're talking about tokenized music on Hedera. So it's awesome. Shout out to all those people. I had to touch on that. But let's dive into what I think is um, the biggest story of the week. Um, and this is something that I think has caused a lot of debate and conversation and kind of introspection for the community in a way. And that is native staking rewards on Hedera. So the headline here is right now you are set to earn substantially less in staking rewards going forward on Hedera because of recent changes voted on by the governing council. So that's the headline here, right, is staking rewards on Hedera are now much lower than they were before. Um, and obviously that's created two sides of an argument, right? Those for it, those against it, um, and all sorts of different ways of looking at it objectively. And we're going to dive into all of that. But a quick refresher on staking on Hedera. It's different than a lot of networks, right? You don't actually stake your H bar. You stake your account to a node. So you either stake all your H bar or none of it. So when you do that, you're not actually connecting your wallet in any way. You're just letting the network know that the balance I could, that, that I hold in this account, I'd like to stake to this node. So the risk is incredibly low, safely the lowest of any, any crypto network out there. It, it can be argued that, that, that it's zero risk, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that myself. It's low risk. And you just earn HBAR. And, and how it works is every transaction on the network is when you pay those transaction fees, those are broken up. Some is sent to the treasury. Um, some is sent to the node operator. But then also some of it is sent to account 0 .0 0.0.800. That balance builds up. And that is the account that disperses HBAR staking rewards to folks that have staked their account natively to a node on Hedera. So that's kind of staking in a nutshell on Hedera. It's much different than any other network. Also worth noting, there are other staking options available on Hedera. There are like liquid staking. And an example of that is Stater, uh, where you can go and send your HBAR to their smart contract and get HBAR X. So it's a liquid staking mechanism. So there's all sorts of different ways in which you can stake. Um, your H bar, and they locked the percentage of emissions at six point five percent, right APR, which is basically above what you would get in a standard, um, like a standard return. In most cases, you know, you're looking at maybe three to five percent or something. So it was very healthy, very attractive. A lot, a lot of people were very excited about it, and a lot of people have been staking. So. What is going on with staking on HBAR? Well, it's being reduced from 6.5% to a maximum of 2.5%, which is well below what would be considered expected for staking on a network. Now, there's many different hairs we can split on this. Hedera cites that the, state, the average staking rate among L1s is much lower than that. Uh, there's plenty of debate around that, but the bottom line is that the staking reward is, is lower and they're expecting things to potentially average out maybe at 1.4%. The cap, right? The maximum is 2.5%. 
So again, just to reiterate, this is a drastic reduction in staking rewards. Um, and basically, I want to give you two explainers for what this news is, what all this is about, and then kind of give you a non-technical explainer. Um, cause I want to, I want to, I want to move through this story and, 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 you know, get everyone the information they need. So basically the treasury management and coin economics committee, also known as CoinCom, of the Hedera governing council has approved changes to the Hedera staking rewards program. Okay. These changes are expected to improve the sustainability of the staking program as network usage increases. The changes which will be implemented on August 11th, okay, uh, include um, the maximum staking reward will be adjusted to 2.5%, right, a maximum. A lot of people think that it's fixed. It will go lower than that, especially um, on the onset. The reward emission cap will be adjusted. So that cap, right, the 2.5% cap will potentially be adjusted. Additional controls will be implemented to algorithmically govern the reward rate. So depending on the amount of HBAR held in account 0.0.800 and other dynamics of the network, you know, example, how much HBAR is staked, the amount of rewards you're going to get is going to fluctuate. So that is definitely worth keeping in mind. The changes are basically a part of Hedera's proof of stake consensus mechanism, which aims to ensure the long-term security mainnet. The changes follow code changes related to staking that were proposed and adopted by the Governing Council in June 2023, right? We talked about that on the last episode, 85, where we reviewed the June and May Governing Council minutes, and it was mentioned in there that these changes would be upcoming. Again, um, not expecting a drastic reduction like we saw. These changes are designed to adjust rates more dynamically. The current maximum staking reward rate of 6.5% will be reduced to 2.5%. Um, and the maximum percentage of coins staked that are eligible for the full reward rate of 2.5% will be 13% of the total supply of 50 billion HBAR. The, if the total amount staked for rewards exceeds 13% of the total supply, the reward rate will drop accordingly. So, right, that's part of that dynamic. Large ecosystem holders of treasury and HBARs, including Hedera, Swirls, and Swirled Labs currently stake without receiving rewards. So that's another note there is sometimes that can be forgotten as well as some of these accounts hold a lot of HBAR and do stake this HBAR, but they're not earning rewards for staking that HBAR. That was mentioned um, by Lehman Baird um, in his initial um, announcement surrounding the new methods in, in which the network would be doing native staking. Um, also the reward rate is set to 2.5% when there are more than 85 million H bars in account 0 0.0.800. Okay. If the account balance goes below 85 million H bar, the maximum reward rate would be automatically reduced. The reward rate may also decrease if an account is staked to a node where the amount staked for reward exceeds the staking maximum or the total staked is below the staking minimum. So that's, again, that other element to staking where each node has a maximum and uh, minimum threshold. These changes only affect the calculation of rewards once implemented and do not ref uh, affect rewards accrued but not yet earned, uh, uh, received. So basically, that point after is really important is this doesn't affect rewards earmarked before the 11th, right? So if you're earning staking rewards, you haven't claimed them, this change isn't going to reduce historical staking rewards. Um, so that's quite a bit to unpack. I'm hoping that other people, that, that everyone has had kind of a chance to, to check out this news ahead of time. I don't want to go too deep into it because there's a lot of kind of things around this I want to discuss. But before we move on, I wanted to give a, a kind of a simple explainer, just kind of like... Um, if you want to kind of know what's going on, this is what's going on. Hedera is making changes to how people earn rewards from staking or holding their digital currency called HBAR. The maximum reward you can earn from staking will be reduced to 2.5%. If too many HBARs are staked, the rewards will drop. Some big players in the Hedera ecosystem stake their HBAR, but they don't earn rewards. The reward rate can change based on the balance of a specific account and the amount staked. 
the changes won't affect any rewards that you have already earned but haven't received yet. That's basically the update. And it seems simple, but there are a lot of implications. And I mean, what questions does this bring up? Because again, this is a big change. And these are the main themes of questions that I see arising in the community and ecosystem around this change. So the first question is, how will the reduction in staking rewards from 6.5 to 2.5% impact the incentive for investors to stake their H bar? Right? So is this change going to make purchasing and holding H bar less of an attractive proposition for investors? Because like we've talked about at the top of the show, there hasn't been a lot of price volatility with H bar. It hasn't really been an exciting asset to invest in right now because there hasn't been a lot of speculative movement. The real benefit has been holding it and earning that 6.5%. The other question is, what is the rationale behind setting the maximum percentage of coins staked at 13% of the total supply? Um, so that, you know, these key variables that will control the emission rate, I think that understanding the decision-making behind those numbers is also going to be interesting. How will the changes to the staking algorithm impact the overall security of the Hedera network, right? So that is the other element to this is with these changes, and I don't know if at this time staking HBAR to the nodes has as much as an, of an impact on security as it may have when community nodes launch, but, you know, that's something that I think is on the community's mind is because staking is definitely a major security mechanism. Any change made to that is, you know, going to raise questions. Um, how will the automatic reduction in reward rate when the balance of account 0.0.800 falls below 85 million H bar impact stakers, right? So how is that dynamic going to play out? We haven't seen that happen before, right? So as the reward rate fluctuates and goes higher or lower, is that going to change the behavior of holders? Are we going to start to see H bar move in different ways that we haven't seen it move? Um, the other thing too is, are there future plans for further ad adjustments or refinements to the staking algorithm in the future? Obviously, I think the answer to this question is yes. Um, but again, um, the community has been reacting to this clearly. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this also, th there's an element to this where the Lehman proposed kind of like a 50-50 split, right? And then the governing council, I think, went for like a different split for these rewards that that um, lowered it to this 2.5%. So obviously going against Lehman's recommendation. And I'm, and obviously, this is a decision that is accepted amongst the governing council. It's not like there's any anyone sounding alarm bells. And I think that in general, inside the community, the consensus is this is a relatively acceptable decision, although it's difficult. But there are a lot of reasons to be highlighted for not doing it. It brings up the scenario in my mind of like, what happens when the governing council does something that Lehman or Mance really dislikes. And how does that play out? Um, you know, it, it, it does make me think about in the future, Mance and Lehman having to talk about things and, and, and disagree in public with the, with the governing council. Just, it just brought that up in my mind because I think about all the things that the governing council does and how th those things may be in disagreement with Mance and Lehman. And they talk about how that's a great quality and, and definitely government governance working on all cylinders. But again, it does kind of paint that picture in my mind of a future scenario that's interesting. Now, what are the pros and cons of this update to staking? Um and this is basically what I've seen around the community and I've tried to distill it into a couple points. So the folks that are for this change and kind of, I think the general argument for this change uh, being the right decision is in general, I think that savvy folks, right? You know, financially or technically savvy folks understand the reasoning behind the decision um, and they aren't as surprised. Um, I think they are surprised at the 
the the uh, size of the draw, for sure. Um, but I do think that they're worried about the potential optics of this, like we talked about. So I think that most people that agree with this change um, understand more how these things work. Like, to be fair, most people, when they saw this go live and they saw CoinCom mentioned, uh, right, which is the uh, Coin Economics Committee on the Governing Council, people are like, who, what, what is CoinCom? Like, what's going on? You know, I don't think a lot of people um, know about the different players involved with the decision making. Um, so basically the, the, there, there's a few other key points to be made for the, for, for the pros to this is, um, one being when you have a dynamic like this in the ecosystem, it does make other DeFi staking protocols more attractive by potentially offering you a higher APR based off of different types of mechanisms that they have at their disposal. Right. So you look at Stater, you look at farming different pools on Saucer Swap. Is this update in the ecosystem to a lower staking rate? Right. Does this create a dynamic of opportunity for DeFi staking and, and um, financial protocols to get more attention? Right. To start seeing more traction because. They're addressing a, a more intense pain point, right? People are going to be looking to get back to that 6.5%. And when you had that native staking paired with how low risk it was, it was a hard decision to go, ah, do I stake on this DeFi platform for, you know, 7, 8% or do I do native staking on Hedera for 6.5? And you really, you're talking about a risk um, trade-off. So a lot of people went, Eh, I'll do the risk. I'll take the less risk option, but down at 2.5%, that's going to be a much more difficult decision, a really difficult decision. And I think that's an opportunity for DeFi um, protocols, third-party staking protocols. It's going to be very, very interesting to watch that space because again, at, at, as of the 11th, um, these changes take effect. Also, um, DeFi girl on Twitter, she's from Swirls. And she posted an interesting thread. And again, she's going off the same information that we have. Um, her name's her name's Micah. And basically, she put together a couple thoughts that I think was a good perspective just in regards to why this would be the right decisions. And I wanted to pull out kind of three quotes from her thread. Uh, number one was, uh, quote, reducing the staking rewards allows for the total... Um, tokens dedicated to staking rewards to be distributed more widely as more users are onboarded and begin staking to the network. Uh, again, quote, the slower drip of token distribution will decrease the likelihood of having a dangerous amount of coins concentrated in the hands of a single entity, increasing network security in the long term. Um, and again, quote, the network remains conservative with its treasury, effectively decreasing the quote burn rate which is always good for the bottom line and could possibly allow for more capital efficiency. So again, another perspective there, which is um, the fact that we are in a bear market, right? The fact that Hedera is um, looking to grow revenue to keep a long runway, right? Tightening the belt a little bit. There are arguments to be made for that. And again, this is, if we want to go out on a limb here even more, if we look at the Hedera ecosystem more broadly, you could, in some cases, argue that this may be similar to someone like the Federal Reserve lowering the risk-free rate, right? It's somewhat similar. It's somewhat similar. Um, but those are the cases for it. What are the arguments against it? Well, regular folks, rightfully so, feel blindsided at a time when Hedera should be holding on to dear life for retail interest they hit folks while they're down, right? This definitely increases negative sentiment and there is counterbalance required. And what I mean by that is this is bad news to a lot of people. This is bad, bad news. So what do we need? We need good news. And we have seen a lot of good news that we'll talk about, but it's, it's definitely very intense for a lot of people. And a lot of people feel blindsided by this. Um, Specifically, I wanted to also highlight 
three points as well from a Twitter thread from Parabolic HBAR Sivo in the community. And it's a great pairing to um, like a, a DeFi Girls thread um, on Twitter. Um, both of them work really well to kind of establish that pro and con column, which you have to have that full picture um, when you're looking through this, because I think that in the weeks to come after this change especially takes effect, we're going to be learning a lot about how this network behaves. But Sivo says, quote, I've heard the argument that these are API tokens, referring to HBAR. It's a technology and not an investment. You should not expect a profit. Okay, that's fine. If you are a quarter L R3 or HLF where there's no IPO or native token. But this is not the case for a public DLT that aims to be decentralized and permissionless. Retail is literally the only way Hedera can fund their operations via HBAR purchases by retail. Also, retail is the only way Hedera can become truly permissionless and truly decentralized. So that's a solid argument. Continuing, quote, so if there is a day where the governing council buys their own gas, aka HBAR, to fund their use case, they will never achieve true decentralization if they have scared off retail, quote, speculators by then. Also, quote, no one is going to secure a network out of the goodness of their hearts just because. So right there, when we look at the pros and cons, um, that's really what it boils down to is on one side, the argument is this is a good but tough decision for the longevity of the network through this bear market and establishing more nuanced market dynamics from other participants, right? So if you create an environment where there's opportunity for other network participants, like again, saucer swap and stater and folks that offer similar opportunities, that's going to be interesting to see. And then the other points we talked about, right? Like um, just helping ensure that HBAR is distributed more widely, all those different things. Pro. The cons are, again, optics are really bad on this and retail feels blindsided. And it would be, it would really kneecap Hedera. To be honest, I would be really scared as an investor if retail holders um, soured on Hedera over this. I don't think that's happening. But um, further to that point is it sends a message that these early folks, right, that held through one cent, you know, through I think it was 2018 or 2019, that bought at 30, 40 cents that are still holding now, right? It, it, it says to them that they're not really a priority. Um, and that may not be true. It's a tough decision. But again, it's like, there are also solid reasons to think this is not a great decision. Now, what are people saying on Reddit about this? The Hedera Reddit community. Um, basically, they're reiterating that there are more than 85 million HBARs in account 0.0.800. The reward rate is set to 2.5%. So really, people are going to be watching that balance. As it goes below 85 million, this reward rate is going to start to be reduced. And we saw that recently the HBAR Foundation contributed um, $20 million uh, to uh, account 0.0.800. So there are entities sending a lot of HBAR to account 0.0.800. Um, but again, we're watching it. Some users express disappointment and confusion, obviously. Um a lot of people are trying to understand the logic behind 2.5%. Why was that chosen? Um, they also were wondering why the cap was moved down from 15 billion to 6.5 billion, right? Because that was when you go past that threshold, it also contributes to a reduction in emissions. So why was that threshold lowered as well? Um, and again, a lot of people talking about their, you know, calling into question them holding H bars, all those different types of things. And 
it makes you think about this, right? Like that's really the story here. And I wanted to go in depth enough on this, but I didn't want to go on too long just because we have a lot of other stories to talk about. But this is probably one of the most substantial changes to Hedera um, from an investor standpoint. And what it shows me is in this week of news, and again, I want to highlight how big this week of news has been. Just this week, okay? Hyundai and Kia are using Hedera. FSCO, Fresh Supply uh, Company, with MasterCard, right, is using Hedera. They've got a new chief open, uh, open source officer. These staking changes. There's fee changes to NFTs that are, you know, also, you know, substantial. Um, there is a new hit from IBM and Boeing. Vance Lima did an interview. I mean, the lots of stuff is happening, but on the, I think I'll reference the staking changes and the fee changes, but then also some of the stuff that we read in the, in the uh, meeting minutes, right? From the last two months is also this governing council is getting bold, right? This year, especially they've had very little reservation in taking bold action on things and doing a lot that I think goes against the desires of the community and retail. And this governing council, for better or for worse, is taking action. They've got their hands on the wheel. Right? And and Mance said in an interview, we'll talk about this later in the show too, but Mance said in an interview um, that when they were doing the transition, leaving Hedera, right? He and Lehman and a lot of the team leaving Hedera and going to Swirls Labs, he was scared that the governing council wouldn't govern in, a, in, in to the capacity that they'd expect. And he said that it's a miracle that they are and it's amazing to see. But this is what you get, right? These these entities, this governing council is making moves that are substantial. And I think that this is just a taste of what's to come. And again, the good and the bad, they're going to make decisions that um, the, the, the large public will disagree with. Um, and that's just the way it is. And a lot of things that we expect not to be changed, right? Like the staking reward rate turns out they make those changes. Um, and furthermore, it's tough because these conversations and topics are surfaced in governing council meeting minutes that are published sometimes months after those meetings take place. And because of that, we get that information and barely have any time to review it before the changes are put into effect, right? These, these aspects of the network were discussed and voted on in June. And we just talked about the meeting minutes last week and already these changes are taking into place. So the community doesn't really have a lot of time to adjust or prepare or, um, you know, like take to account these, these upcoming changes. So that's a big aspect to this. And my last point on this is I put on, you know, going way out on a limb here. Is this also within the context of new governing council members, right? Because we know, again, from the Manson Lehman interview that we're going to talk about a little later, is basically there are bargaining chips when it comes to attracting new governing council members and how the network is run and what the, you know, specs are, right? Early on, what the bylaws were. Um, is this lowering of the native staking rewards rate a bargaining chip? Um, because a prospective governing council member, you know, effectively lobbies the governing council and convinces them that this is the right decision to do and they're not going to join unless it's done. You know, that's also a, that's also something because on that exact meeting, governing council meeting minutes, they said that um, the governing council entered an executive session to discuss considerations about a new potential governing council member. So, you know, there's all sorts of things around that, but 
that is the update on staking rewards on Hedera. It's huge. I'd encourage people to read on it. Again, the full story is in the Twitter thread pinned to the top of the spaces. And that's the headline. Your staking rewards are going from 6.5% to 1.5 to 2.5% going forward as of August 11th. So that's that. Make of it what you will. There are pros and cons. What side do you land on? Um, let's blast through a couple other news items here before we get to some bigger ones. Um, we have updates from Saucer Swap. They've opened a new stablecoin liquidity pool for HUSDC. And this is big because uh, a, a major discussion topic that I see in the scope of growing the network is checking the box of a highly liquid network native stablecoin. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's all sorts of boxes that Hedera wants to check, right? High TVL, lots of transactions, governing council members, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at it from an outside perspective, right, as someone checking boxes of whether Hedera is a good, as they call it, blockchain network, you go, well, what's the stable coin on there that has a lot of liquidity? And we just don't have a stable coin with a lot of liquidity on, on Hedera, which is makes things difficult because that is important. So Saucer Swap launching this uh, yield farm for HBAR and USDC. And again, USDC natively minted on Hedera as an HTS token. Um, good news, right? So I think that we're going to start to see more um, efforts and initiatives for a higher liquidity stablecoin native to Hedera. So that's a, that's definitely a vibe. Um, we talked about this last week too, but the Algorand and Hedera communities continue to have clashes, mostly because of, remember that poster um, from UCL? or No, it wasn't UCL, it was from Hedera or from the HBAR Foundation, one of those. What are those bar graph charts that we know all too well that breaks down the the performant nature of Hedera compared to other DLTs and specifically highlights transactions? Um, the algorithm community is upset because the amount of transactions on that poster doesn't really reflect what their network is capable of and they're upset by it. So, I mean cool. I mean, Hedera is getting to be more widely known and, you know, kicking up steam. Uh, but also this is something that Hedera should act on. I mean, the last thing that we need right now is another community that has a problem with Hedera and Hedera coming across like they don't really value or care for other networks or just retail investors or whatever in general. It's like, just update the poster you know, re, you know, do some further due diligence, update the poster. There's no reason to, you know, for it to be outdated and just publish it as a sign of goodwill. Because at the end of the day, it's like, if any of these other networks do well, Hedera does well. Like no other DLT out there needs to fail for Hedera to succeed. It's just, it's just dumb to think that another uh, crypto network needs to, you know, crap out for Hedera to succeed. It's just not true. And it actually harms Hedera, right? When you look at the optics of crypto right now, they're not great, right? Many people are think it's, uh, you know, a, a bunch of hooligans and tomfoolery. Uh, but the reality is a lot of cool stuff happening. And there's a lot of cool stuff happening on other networks. That's just a reality. Sometimes even cooler stuff. So to have a network like that, uh, you know, just not do well or, uh, you know, fizzle out just doesn't look good for the space. Doesn't help Hedera. Um, we, you know, we're all in the same boat, especially in this bear market. So if you have to update a bar graph, right, update the bar graph, make everyone happy. The last thing we need right now is a crypto community upset with Hedera. Um, H bar has been added to the Nexo exchange. Um, so that's another pain point is people talk about the fact that not enough exchanges list Hedera. Well, here we are. We got another exchange listing in Hedera. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other little news stories we want to sandwich in here before we dive into um, some more 
big stuff. I really think it's pretty much all big stories this week, guys. It's uh, it's definitely a vibe. Um, I wanted to say too, real quick, just while we're we're hanging out here on a Sunday, really appreciate everyone down below tuning in. It's it always blows my mind, like um, you know, seeing everyone tune in, especially like regulars. Like I see people that have been listening, um, like constantly all the time. Like um, you know, uh, Benny the H Barbarian down there, uh, Davin. Um, H. Bras, uh, Kimchi, uh, uh, Cisco Trader, Tata. Dot H. Bar, all you guys. I mean, uh, Marbar. Um, you know, it's just like it's it's uh, it's crazy to see uh, people tuning in every week. It's wild. And I mean, the Hashgraph News and Rumors show averages about 500 listeners every week on Twitter Spaces. Right, that's huge, um, and hundreds more on podcast platforms. Over the years, I've covered every major Adara news event, unpacked almost every juicy rumor, and hosted countless in-depth discussions with important figures in the Hedera ecosystem. And the best part, I've been able to broadcast it all live with you guys. Like I do each of these episodes live. I could very easily just do this episode right here, just talking into my computer and post it later. But there's just something about doing it live that's exciting. I mean, anything could happen right now, right? Anything could happen right now. My phone could die. I, how thrilling is that? If you'd like to support the show, consider making an H bar contribution, like many folks in the community have been doing. Um, and honestly, like straight up, even a few bucks add up. I mean, I get little donations here and there from from folks in the ecosystem, um, and it's adding up. I'm actually going to be able to do some really exciting things with the show. It's it's wild. So um, you can send a contribution to enthusiast dot H bar using your Hedera wallet. Uh, and I do appreciate funny and or supportive or encouraging memos. Um, I always get those in the fun I share them with Twitter. The show's full Hedera address is in the podcast show notes, YouTube description, and in the mega thread up on the Jumbotron. Get all the info you need about the show at itsbrandond.com slash hbar. Also too, again, just if, you, if you're looking for a way to help out the show that's really easy, leave a rating and review for the show on Apple Podcasts. Spotify and Google podcasts, leave a comment on YouTube. It honestly helps. Like, I mean, the Hedera community is still pretty small, but I mean, I think this show um, is helping uh, folks a lot. Um, and again, the address to send a contribution to is pinned up above. I appreciate you guys. Let's talk about something incredibly exciting. FSCO, Fresh Supply Company. Um, and let's just see also too, if people are leaving some, uh, some comments, I, man, there's so much Twitter spam now. It's crazy. As soon as I post something, I get so much, or sorry, X, X spam. There's X spam. Anyways, I don't know if other people are noticing that, but, um, lots more spam, but this is the big, I'd say the other big news item this week. And we've been talking about this for months. I've had the CEO as a guest on the show. When did I have him on the show? Let me search it up so I can tell you guys what uh, what episode to uh, to listen to. Um, I'm not going to be able to find it right now. Anyways, I've had him on the show. It was about a couple months ago. Go listen to it if you can find the episode. It's it's uh, it's fantastic. Um, but this is FSCO, right? Fresh Supply Company. Um, and this is the use case that a lot of people in the ecosystem has been, have been incredibly excited about for a few reasons. Number one, it's a supply chain use case. So it kind of leapfrogs off of what's already happening on Hedera with Atma IO from Avery Dennison. Hedera has set a foothold as the supply chain carbon offset, um, network. And this is another big use case. And I think the hook for this was, um, and, and I'm going to give my own opinion on this scenario. This is just my my personal opinion. But basically, um, there was a product from MasterCard called Providence Blockchain. And it was very similar to a lot of private blockchain DLT projects out there. And the largest user of this was FSCO. And they use this to do um, tracking of food as it traveled around. 
payments, um, settlements, all these different types of things, right? And MasterCard sunset their Providence blockchain product, right? AKA um, it kind of went out of business. It, it just wasn't that successful. They sunset it. And I find it interesting because again, this this is just my opinion is IBM blockchain was launched leveraging, I'm pretty sure it leverages Hyperledger Fabric and obviously Hedera Hashgraph as well. Um, I feel that clearly IBM blockchain and MasterCard Providence were competing products in that market. IBM blockchain, I feel, was superior and MasterCard Providence was inferior. And here we are. So FSCO, what do they do? Well, they look for another network to move to to give them the same performance and value that the MasterCard Providence blockchain gave them. They they chose Hedera, right? They partnered with the HBAR Foundation. And when I had uh, David, right, the CEO on the show, he was talking about how they were going to be launching, um, what their use case would be used for, how exciting it was. But more interestingly, he mentioned that it's half of the story. And he said that to me a few months ago on the show. And I want you all to keep that in mind as we as we look through this, because this could very well be the whole story. But to me, it does feel as though David's words still ring true, that this is half of the story. So Fresh Supply Company has integrated Hedera into its continuity payment trigger API, which was previously used on the now discontinued private MasterCard Providence blockchain. The, AP, the, the continuity API allows Hedera to connect to a, ACH, right, bank-to-bank -bank payments, the MasterCard network, and soon the MasterCard payment gateway service, MPGS, that focuses on online use cases like e-commerce, right? So already very interesting, right? FSCO is bringing their, effectively their tech stack that used to connect a DLT to MasterCard, right? Now they're connecting Hedera to MasterCard. That's a very simple way you could look at this. The Continuity API is designed to be plug and play, requiring no additional integration for projects that used MasterCard Providence. So that's the other angle of this is this is designed for all the other users that used MasterCard's product to come over with FSCO and use Hedera instead. This has attracted the largest former users of MasterCard's private network, paving the way for these companies to adopt Hedera, right? Massive. And, and again, I think that hints at the other half of the story. FSCO chose Hedera after testing multiple other blockchain networks. They chose it due to its unmatched scalability, low fixed fees, and sustainability. The unique Hedera Governing Council model also provides the stability that big companies need, FSCO uses Hedera in three different but related use cases, supply chain and Internet of Things, right, IoT, real world assets, tokenization, and next generation payments. Um, the payment trigger functionality that Continuity provides is a core component of FSCO's product offering on the Hedera network. It allows for the tokenization and fractionalization of real world assets and events throughout the agri agricultural supply chain. So lots of big words, right? Basically um, what it means is giant tokenized assets that are worth, let's say hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars can be fractionalized and different payments can be triggered on those different fractions. So again, all sorts of other layers to this. As items move through the supply chain, Payments are only released when their pre-approved conditions are met. The process is automated with payment triggers combined with Internet of Things devices, improving efficiency. So again, things moving through the supply chain, um, certain conditions needing to be met, all of these different things that, that cause so much overhead, mistrust, um, are now just going to be handled leveraging AI, Hedera, uh, integrating MasterCard services, connecting directly to banks to move payments based on certain uh, conditions through this tech stack provided by FSCO. Again, huge. By using Hedera, FSCO brings unprecedented transparency to supply chain management, 
providing rich data to financiers who need to calculate their credit risk assessments. Because again, money needs to move through the supply chain to make things happen. Things are bought and things are sold. Give me a sec here. I'm just going to crack another non-alcoholic mojito. I'm going heavy here this evening, folks. This is a big, this is a big uh, news day. Oh, these are, these are honestly delicious. These are honestly delicious. I don't want to give away the brand name. I don't want people to think I'm getting sponsored by a beverage company. Um, FSCO processed $700 million worth of assets in the past year and is targeting $3 billion over the next 12 months. So $3 billion worth of assets will be processed within the next 12 months on Hedera as it accelerates payments across Australia's agribusiness and food manufacturing sectors. As FSCO continues to scale, they will leverage all major Hedera services, the Hedera Consensus Service, the Hedera Token Service, and the Hedera Smart Contract Service. And now, what's the big breadcrumbs and takeaways here? Well, number one is that mentioned that they're going to be leveraging all sorts of different services. We know now from the recent interview with Manson Lehman that we'll talk about, Mance mentions that although at my IO from Avery Dennison um, contributes 95% of tr or more, uh, you could say you could safely say 98, 99% of transactions on the mainnet, even though that's the case, it's only responsible for 75% of revenue. Why is that? Because at my IO uses almost exclusively the Hedera consensus service. So these different services that were mentioned, right? The consensus service, the token service, the smart contract service, they're not all equal. The consensus service makes very, very little money for Hedera. Per transaction, the consensus service makes 0 0.0001 cents. It's tiny. It makes very little money for Hedera. Now, if you look at other services on the Hedera network, like the token service, and like the smart contract service, now you're talking one cent or 10 cents or a dollar per transaction. So for sure, you might have a billion transactions every 10 days running through the network um, of HCS transactions. But if you had maybe a million of another type, you might see a 10 times increase in revenue for Hedera. So not all transactions are priced equally. They're all different. So that's what's exciting about this FSCO use case is the specificity of saying they are going to use multiple services. It's like a wink and a nod saying, yes, this use case will make a good amount of money for Hedera. So that's been interesting. The other thing is um, in the article and press release, quote, a guardian Integration is also planned, and this is critical because the Hedera Guardian is the tech stack that powers and enables all of these carbon offset use cases like Atmaio and, and Dovu and all these other things. And to see a use case like FSCO mention specifically that they will be working on an integration with the Guardian and you look at supply chain and you make the addition of carbon offset credits, this incredibly compelling and exciting uh, new use case becomes even more important and exciting. Um, so that was a big takeaway. Um, now let's talk about some questions. Um, what are the implications of FSCO plans to leverage all of Hedera's major services, right? Obviously, revenue generation and diversified use cases, um, it could begin a tidal wave, right? This could begin a, a sharp increase in revenue for Hedera. We'll have to see. Uh, but that's a big question. The other question is, what are the implications of Hedera's connection to the MasterCard network and the MasterCard payment gateway services? What is the, what's going on? And we're going to explore that a little bit. Also, how does FSCO's decision to choose Hedera over other blockchain networks reflect on Hedera's competitive advantages? It would be very interesting to know a little more about what were the pieces of information that informed that decision. Um, and what are the potential use cases for the continuity API in the supply chain? That's going to be interesting to know as well, is what are these new use cases where it's mentioned um, that 
um, you know, other former users of MasterCard's private network uh, will be potentially adopting Hedera. What do those use cases look like, right? Um, and some other tidbits that were mentioned in the recent hours after this announcement, FSCO tweets, version one went live on mainnet. So version one of this use case is live currently on mainnet. Um, and David, the CEO, says three interesting things on Twitter. Number one is, um, in a response to one of my posts, he says, uh, Spenda has already been testing in our sandbox. Um, so for those unfamiliar, um, Spenda is a IT services management company. Um, they do kind of B2B payment solutions. They're like a technology integrator um, and have been at the center of a few very exciting um, Hedera news items. So, um, you know, the CEO of FSCO specifying that Spenda has already been testing in their sandbox. That's very exciting. Uh, something else is um, the evolution, right? A V O L U T I O N. Uh, David mentions that this was FSCO's first customer in 2018. They're responsible for 80% of avocado exports from Australia. Um, and he tags Hedera, right? So just basically flexing a little bit that, like, listen, there's some big brands, there's some big moves that are going to be happening on this use case. He also says, to be clear, this will be utilized across many supply chain and commodity types, including but not limited to agri-food, ESG, conditional event-based payment triggers equals FSCO continuity. So basically, he's again implying that this is not going to be limited to just FSCO. Now, what is the second half of this story? Because that seems like a lot, right? And I think that the second half of this story involves MasterCard. And we'll just we'll just take a quick pit stop here for a minute. Now, for those unfamiliar, there have been many rumors, speculation, breadcrumbs about connections that MasterCard has to Hedera. Um and also use cases uh, specifically. Um, and MasterCard being so closely aligned with FSCO. And again, it can't be understated. FSCO was using a MasterCard product. MasterCard had their own blockchain that was private, that now no longer exists. And a Hedera use case, FSCO, has created an integration for MasterCard systems to integrate with Hedera and access Hedera. So you really start to think about these dots being connected, this speculative environment, and dare I say, you start to think about MasterCard on the governing council, right? Um, and it makes sense. It's funny because, too, the, the whole concept of the Hedera Governing Council was based off of um, Visa, right? That book from the Visa founder that Manson Lehman referenced uh, very often um, was the inspiration for the Hedera Governing Council and how that organization would be structured. So it'd be funny to have MasterCard and not Visa join as a Governing Council member. But then you start to, this This is where this news item, right? So we're kind of done with the FSCO stuff, right? Big news story, big new use case, big news. And these guys are heavy hitters. And they're the real deal, right? Pat him on the show. He's constantly on Twitter, very transparent. This is the real deal, right? In every way. But again, these close ties to MasterCard. And we're going to circle back really quick to the top of the show where we were talking about the recent pump in price on HBAR and what could be driving that. And you could say um, it's the Hyundai and Kia news that we're going to talk about. Or you could say it was the FSCO news that we just talked about. You could say a lot of things. But you just start to think about, you know, the governing council and the fact in the June governing council minutes that the folks had to go into an executive session to discuss a potential governing council member 
that MasterCard just has all these connections and all these different things. It just really makes you think about MasterCard joining the governing council, right? Um, it would be really crazy. And Hedera is really fun that way with the governing council because it's so crazy to speculate. We already have Google on the governing council. We already have IBM. It's not like we're speculating whether a heavy hitter is going to come. We already have those. It's just a matter of which one now. And we've talked about Microsoft. We've talked about Walmart. We've talked about ExxonMobil, for God's sake. No joke. Um, MasterCard. It really makes you think. Does somebody know? Was somebody front running the price knowing that there would be a governing council announcement next week? Will it be MasterCard? Purely speculation, but the FSCO news has me thinking. Um, I'm not going to go on any more about that. Again, it's just purely speculation. It's just what people are talking about, but you can't not talk about it. Um, it's so big. Like this news story itself is so big. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see. Also, too, shout out. Uh, they were in the newspaper. There's an Australian newspaper. FSCO and Hedera was mentioned in the Australian newspaper, a physical newspaper. Um, at Rob One Becca published a photograph of a paper newspaper with that. So that was kind of cool. Um, now, let's talk about an update from Adara just in regards to their um, new senior open source officer, um, a new position, a so so, COSO, whatever you want to call it. Um, what's this all about? Uh, I don't know. What a chief open source officer does exactly. I mean, Hedera is open sourced already, so I don't know what else there's left to do. Uh, I don't know how much this guy's getting paid. Uh, but in all seriousness, I will say that um, in the ecosystem at large, there's a lot that needs to be done in regards to open sourcing, auditing, and just making tooling, infrastructure, and all those different types of things, uh, you know, accessible and available. Um, so... On the flip side, I could totally see how it makes sense having someone at, I guess this guy's at a VP level. I don't know. But definitely C-Suite. He is the uh, chief open source officer. His name is Andrew Aitken. And they've appointed him. And his task is to lead Hedera's transformation into a fully open source Web3 platform, whatever that means. Andrew is a veteran at the open, in the open source sector, having served as an open source expert to the White House, guest lecturer for Stanford's Entrepreneur Program, and the founder of the industry's only think tank. The only think tank, guys. In his new role, Aitken will assist Hedera in open sourcing everything from tooling to cross-chain functionality and source code. Aitken previously held open source... Uh, led the open source team at WePro Technologies, a member of the Hedera Governing Council since 2020. So that's an interesting note. Um, he's an elected member of the board of the FinTech Open Source Foundation and previously served as WePro's board advisor at the Open Source Security Foundation, Linux Foundation Networking. The announcement follows the successful launch of the Hedera Imp Improvement Proposal Program and Hedera intends to continue progressing towards full decentralization and blah, blah, blah. So basically, they've got a new guy at the top, chief open source officer. Um, we'll find out more. I think it's just like, it, it's so important um, to focus on the open source narrative in the crypto market. So important to keep this top of mind. Let's watch what Andrew does. Let's see what's going on. I'm hoping that we can get some updates directly from the man himself as Adara continues the growth that they are doing. Now, speaking of interesting news items, um, on August 2nd, we got a news update that kind of like, if you want to talk about things that truly surprised me, um, this one... It's weird, like, it totally makes sense, but it wasn't what I was expecting this week at all. Um, so, Hyundai Motor Corp uh, basically has decided Hedera is very cool, and they told their buddies Kia, um, hey, you know, 
we got to get on this. So what's going on? Well, Hayato Motor Company and Kia Corporation have launched a blockchain-based supplier CO2 emissions monitoring system, also known as a SCAMS. I thought that was cute. On the Hedera mainnet. Hyundai Motor Group is a global enterprise that has created value chain based on uh, or created a value chain based on mobility, steel, and construction, as well as logistics, finance, IT, and services. So again, this is like this isn't just the car company, right? This is the Hyundai Motor Group. The SCEMS, right? The C the supplier CO2 emission monitoring system is designed to compute carbon emissions at every stage of the supply chain, enabling Hyundai Motor and Kia to secure reliable data across its supplier business operations, including procurement of raw materials, the manufacturing process, and product transportation. So, sound familiar? Supply chain, baby. This is what Hedera is all about. They're rocking and rolling. You got the supply. We got the chain. Let's just know a chain. It's a graph, but you know what I mean. Um, the head of materials research and engineering center at Hyundai Motor in Kia believes that blockchain technology holds the key to managing carbon emissions and combating climate change, ushering in a new era of sustainable supply chains. It must be great for these corporations to um, talk about these things and actually be able to back them up in tangible ways. That's one thing that's exciting about Hedera. Um, the SCEMS also integrates AI technology making it possible to set carbon reduction targets and accurately predict future carbon emissions. The combination of AI technology and the high performance of Hedera network enables Hyundai Motor, Kia, and their partners to preemptively meet local and global environmental regulations and establish sustainable supply chains. Um, so that's what this is all about. That's, it's, it's basically the same news story for all of these use cases. We said the same thing for Atma. We said the same thing for Dobu. We said the same thing for... Tolem Earth, like all these different use cases that are in that kind of carbon offset credit spaces. It's all about taking an industry that is so, you know, messed up. Like the carbon offset industry is so ass backwards. It's not even funny. It's garbage. But the value is there. And the technology that Hashgraph brings makes that industry arguably possible again. Um, and these big companies are seeing that. Now, um, what are people saying in the community? I pulled a couple of insights from the Hedera Reddit community on this news story. Some users speculate that this could lead to Hyundai becoming a governing council member. You're right. So I never thought of that, but that's, you know, some discussion around that. The community also recognizes the significance of having a major car manufacturer like Hyundai involved with Hedera. So that's also interesting. Users note that actions adding value to the Hedera, uh, to HBAR, will be reflected in the price. So that's the other side of things is kind of like when you look at these different news items and you think about HBAR potentially as a little more of a commodity, it's like these news stories are exciting because this is a news story about somebody that will be utilizing the network and paying for it. That's what we want to see. Um there's also a lot of people um, highlighting the popularity of Hedera in South Korea with successful tests of the stablecoin pilots with Shinhan Bank, right, that we talked about a couple episodes ago. So that is, right, when we talk about just the geographical component to Hedera and the global aspect to it is South Korea, right, this is where some interesting things are happening. Um, and also, too, I mean, the thing, the thing to remember is um, Hyundai uh, Motor Group, they have... 5.2% share of the global car market. So it's a big, big company. Um, and I mean, again, big news, very positive. I think people are pumped up about it. Um, and yeah, my thoughts on it are basically, uh, we have a new business vertical that is building on Hedera. It's all about diversifying revenue sources for this, for this organization, Hedera, right? A lot of the revenue comes from one use case, right? From one um, company and that company's on the governing council. So to see a comparably large company like Hyundai Motor Group utilizing the, the planning to utilize the network in this way, um, not only is it a diversification um, in revenue from a use case standpoint, but also from a company standpoint, 
but not only that, also from an industry standpoint, right? The automotive industry, but not only that, also from a geographical standpoint. So this is exciting, I think, for a lot of those reasons is um, Hyundai just kind of comes right out of left field. And I think it's a perfect fit. It's not another, it's not another um, American, um, you know, supply chain company, right? It's a South Korean uh, car. Like, I mean, this is a supply chain use case, but from the optic standpoint, from how people view the network and the use cases, it, I like that it's filling things out. Um, also talking about filling things out and building, um, there's a few governing council members that I think are highly active and that are kind of those OG governing council members. You can lump IBM and Boeing into that group. IBM and Boeing are pretty quiet though, right? Like, I mean, I did, um, I did interview, um, Sean from IBM recently uh, on the Genfinity show. Um, he's on the board, uh, the governing council board for Adira. I've had an interesting conversation with him, but largely IBM and Boeing, like they're pretty quiet publicly. Like they're, they're, they're giant faceless corporations. So um, it's hard to see their movements when it comes to Adira specifically, right? They've made a hip. Um, for those unfamiliar with HIPS, Hedera Improvement Proposal, it's ways in which folks like myself or you guys or anyone in the community can package up an idea that's either like a piece of tooling, a change to the hash graph, or just a set of standards and run it through the HIP process and get it added to the network, voted on by the governing council and put into action. So it's the pathway to make change on the network. Anyone can do it, including governing council members like Boeing and IBM. And this is exciting because it's these two massive governing council members that are taking this pathway and I really think puts them so much closer to the community um, because this hip is right up beside um, community hips and also hips by Lehman and uh, members of Swirls and stuff. So it's it's really interesting to see this, and I think it excited people in a lot of ways. And I want to break down this hip uh, of what it actually is. And again, this is a little, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I want to just let people know this is an important news story. And if you're a little, if, you, if, you're, if you're technically savvy, I'm going to go through a couple things here and we'll move on. If you're not, bear with me. It's just important. I want to get the info out to people. So what is this hip in summary? So the proposal is about integrating anonymous credentials with the Hedera ledger, right? And on and in creds, right? Anonymous credentials is a system that allows for the issuance and verification of credentials while preserving the privacy and anonymity of the credential holder. It's similar to what Lehman would talk about when he says being able to show the bar that you're over 18 without showing them your ID, right? Turning it into a yes or no question. The motivation behind this proposal is is to build self-sovereign identity solutions with Hedera as the verifiable data registry, right? So using Hedera as a core component of SSI. This would also support the migration of current pilots or older implementations to the Hedera network as needed. So that's also interesting. Um, anonymous credentials is based on the concept of zero knowledge proofs, which allow the verification of certain statements without revealing any sensitive information. This technology has been widely used since 2017 as a part of the Hyperledger Indy and now the Hyperledger in on Creds project. Their proposal suggests that Hedera can serve as an ideal verifi verifiable data registry for these solutions with prominent council members such as IBM, Boeing, Standard Bank, and others expressing active interest. The proposal also mentions that the support for the Hedera network as an Uncred's verifiable data registry can be accomplished without any changes to the core Hedera platform, which is, again, also very interesting. So this isn't a hip about actual changes. This, to me, feels a little bit maybe like a hip, a standards hip, right? Maybe with a little bit of tooling needed or something. Um... 
So the hip outlines a recommended approach is to extend the Aries cloud agent implementation to support the Hedera public ledger as the verifiable data registry. ACA is a popular tool for managing and interacting with anonymous credentials in cloud-based environments. The HIP suggests using the Cardano AnonCred method as a reference method for implementation. AnonCred's objects could adopt a format similar to the approach taken by Cardano, right? So borrowing a little bit from other networks, that's what this is all about, guys. And I mean, I'm going to bring up what we were talking about earlier about the Algorand community upset with some outdated graphs published by Hedera and the HBAR Foundation in regards to comparisons for TPS amongst networks and the Algorand community being upset that their network not is not being represented properly. We have to break down these barriers. We have to avoid um, the, this budding of heads amongst networks as much as possible if it means just literally updating a bar graph or updating a web page. Just do it. Because you have governing council members borrowing ideas from other networks such as Cardano for ways in which to elevate the Hedera network drastically. So governing council members directly borrow ideas from other L1 networks for Hedera. So keep that in mind. We all need each other. Just wanted to highlight that. Um, the proposal also outlines the next steps, which include identifying and scoping ACA uh, by enhancements to support the Hedera as the VDR and creating Hedera and Uncred's method along the lines of the Cardano implementation. The proposal concludes by stating that there are no current implementations for a Hedera and Uncred's method, but references to similar extensions of Anoncred that can be found in Hyperledger uh, Methods Registry. So basically, this big hip is about bringing kind of this anonymous credential, zero-knowledge proof functionality and standards to the network, borrowing from other existing um, ecosystems and tooling and methods and all these different types of things. Very exciting stuff. I think the main headline here is just this... Um, very direct line of involvement in building the network publicly from governing council members. It's very cool. Now, what are the main questions um, in regards to this? Now, the, and this is what I've kind of been seeing in the community and just in general. Number one is, what are the potential challenges or obstacles to implementing this proposal? Is this going to be some kind of like crazy two-year long drawn out kind of thing where then you end up having a bunch of different people trying to reinvent the wheel their own way? Or is this something expeditious? We don't know. How will this proposal ensure compatibility with other ledger technologies? It's been mentioned that that will be the case, but it'll be interesting to know kind of how that's going to be done. Uh, you know, the third question is what's the timeline? It'd be really interesting to know when they expect the work to begin on this or how long they think it's going to take. And then lastly, what kind of support or resource, resources will be needed from the Hedera community to implement this proposal. Because again, the Governing Council, Hedera, Swirls, these folks don't build in isolation. They always depend on the efforts and sweat equity of the community, right? Of just um, regular builders on the network. Um, whether it's them needing to rework their application services and projects to meet changes to the network, or whether, you know, this effort will require resources or assistance from the community. That would be interesting to know. Because again, it's a big, it's a big vibe. It's a big deal. So um, that is a big substantial news story of the week. Hyundai supply chain, the car industry, what's going on in South Korea, all sorts of stuff happening. It's exciting. I mean, this is this is super exciting. Now, something else that's got me quote unquote excited, for better or for worse, is the updates to pricing for NFTs in the ecosystem. Now, I want to give people a quick little refresh. Um, NFTs on Hedera are unique for all the reasons we know, right? They're minted right to the L1. They don't need smart contracts. They have built-in guaranteed royalties. They're very inexpensive to mint. They have fixed fees. 
uh, for the longest time to mint a 10,000 NFT collection, it would be $78 and 20 cents. Um, comparatively to other networks, which could be hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, it's eco, beyond dare is eco-friendly. It's fast. It's ABFT, all these different types of things, right? We know these differences about Hedera in the NFT space and what sets it apart. Um, being the least expensive option for minting NFTs is definitely um, a benefit uh, to Hedera, right? Because it's a very attractive proposition. But this recent update makes Hedera not the least expensive network to mint NFTs on. Now, a lot of people in the community has expressed their interest or their their thoughts on this um, both ways. And it's really interesting. And I think that I, I agree with the update. I think it makes sense. But it does really make you think. So what's actually going on? Well, Hedera's non-fungible token ecosystem has seen a significant growth and adoption over the last year. Uh, with the emergence of various innovative applications, such as NFT marketplaces, minting tools, and advanced NFT analytics, the number of active monthly NFT ecosystem accounts has jumped from 1,570, right, 1,570 in November 2021, to over 19,537 as of July 2023, indicating growing interest in NFTs on the Hedera network. And that might seem small, but again, and something. To accommodate this growth and ensure the sustainability of the NFT ecosystem, the Hedera Council has decided to change the network fee schedule for minting NFTs in the upcoming version 0.41 release of the mainnet. The storage cost for NFT data on validator nodes is higher than initially expected. So the cost to make NFTs exist on Hedera is more than expected. That's the that's the key reasoning for this decision that's important here, right? Especially with the availability of bulk minting NFTs on the Hedera network. This has led to a review and revision of the fee schedule. And again, Hedera can change their fees for these network services anytime they want. And by Hedera, I mean the governing council. Under the new pricing schedule, the fee for minting individual NFTs will be reduced from $0.05 cents to $0.02. Cents. Now, whoa, you might be saying, hey, Brandon, what are you talking about? You're talking about NFTs getting more expensive to mint, but you're saying that the cost per NFT mint is going down by $0.03. Cents. What do you mean? Well, something that a lot of people don't know about minting NFTs on Hedera is you can bundle NFT mint transactions which means that when you mint an NFT, it's not like you mint one at a time. It's you can mint 10 at a time as one transaction. Okay? So you effectively can cut the cost down by 10 times by bundling those transactions. So that's what made the cost of minting a 10,000 NFT collection so low was that you could bundle those transactions 10 at a time. And that was the main uh, benefit there. Now, they talk about lowering the NFT mint fee from $0.05 cents to $0.02. Cents. So it's those two things in combination, right? As they mentioned, it's we're lowering the cost per NFT, but we're also removing the ability to do that bulk minting. So you lose the very cheap price minting large collections but if you're just going to be minting a dozen NFTs, theoretically, it could be cheaper. So it's 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 a trade-off. Um, but again, it's one of those things where you have an organization like Hedera that's needing revenue, especially at a time like this. And updating these fees, it makes sense. And basically, um, if you're bulk minting 10,000 NFTs, the cost will now be $200 instead of $76.80. So that's an increase, but also a decrease. It's weird, but that's kind of the way it is. And it makes Hedera no longer the cheapest L1 to mint NFTs on. Um, but that's basically the main story here. These changes are designed to ensure economic sustainability of the Hedera network. 
um, and allow the ecosystem to provide scalable services to all participants. And that's basically what this is about is revenue. It's revenue, baby. We got new use cases coming. We need to make money. That's what this is about. Um, and that's really what we're going to have to try to do. Um, but the ways in which Hedera tries to do it, how far are they going to push it? Um, now the main questions, or actually, so this, this is when this is going to happen. So the fee schedule change will take effect on the main net with, as I said, the version 0 0.141 uh, uh, release of the Hedera services code. The testnet upgrade will be set for Thursday, August 22nd, and the main net upgrade will be September 12th. So on September 12th, it will be substantially more expensive to mint NFTs on Hedera, but also less expensive in some way. Who knows? It, 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 this is the way it works. Um, now, the two main questions I think that is raised by the community after this is, uh, what measures are being taken to ensure that the new fee structure doesn't discourage smaller projects or individual creators from minting NFTs on Hedera? And that ties into the, the optics aspect of this, right? Is um, at one time we could say Hedera was the most affordable platform to mint NFTs on, no longer the case. So that is going to arguably make it more difficult to onboard people we'll have to see. But that's what's going on. Um, and that's the update for NFT fees on Adira. Um, and it's definitely uh, a big update, but, you know, but a lot of that this week. Um, let's talk about, let me, let me see if there's any like little odds and sides here that we can jump into before we get into kind of our last stories here and wind it down. Um, it's funny, I sent out a tweet recently where it's like, um, I'm literally overwhelmed this week with the news. Like, I couldn't believe how much news there was this week and how much there was to cover. That's why, I, again, it's another longer episode. Um, it's just crazy, but it's like, I think there's a, there's a direct correlation between how long this show is and the growth of the, the Hedera network. Um, it's crazy. Like, like, I have to start cutting news stories from the show like there's there's news stories i wanted to talk about this week that i just couldn't do because there's just too much to talk about it's crazy um so let me see here is there any like little odds and sods here to talk about oh em tech this is a fun update em tech um advanced with a four million dollar um Cash injection or investment? What, what was this? This is a TechCrunch article too, which is super cool. I'm going to head again. I had Carmel on last week on the show. Um, uh, yeah, seed investment by Matrix Partners, um, India. So $4 million seed investment to EM Tech. Shout out. Um, good stuff. Love seeing it. Um, now, and I think, that, let me see if this is our last story of the day. This might be our last story of the day, guys. And it's actually a perfect way um, to end the show. It is beautiful. Okay. We're almost through guys. Thank you for sticking it out. We're almost through. Okay. The Manson Lehman interview on the H bar bull show published Friday. Um, I don't know how many of you watched it. Um, I definitely watched it and I do have to say that these Manson Lehman interviews um, at some, sometimes feel like a repeat, like they're constantly telling the same stories over and over and over again. Uh, they're reiterating the same points over and over again. Um, they talked about doing their own series, their fireside chats where they talk about other things. I, I'm wondering what's going on with that. Um, that'd be fun. But despite what I would call like a little bit of staleness to these interviews that they give, it's just so nice to see those guys giving an interview. I miss the month. Remember, do you remember when Hedera would do monthly town halls on Zoom? And Manson Lehman would be on that Zoom call, right? Every month I would be in my pajamas on my computer on Zoom and be on a call with Manson Lehman and, and see everyone talk about what's happening with Hedera. It was crazy. So we don't get to see those guys enough. So it's also... I mean, I, I, I'm just kind of whining, but um, it was a, overall super solid interview. I mean, the H Bar Bull is doing awesome stuff. I watch his show every week. I would highly encourage people to watch the show. But 
Um, again, I do feel that they look through things like with rose colored glasses a little bit. Like you ask them, like, how's the network going? They're like, oh, it's going amazing. We're so blown away. It's incredible. I never see Mans and Lehman kind of say like, oh, I wish we could have done that or uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, we could do this better. I, I don't think they can right now. I think they really have to fluff it up as any crypto founder does. But again, it's like, you know, it is what it is. Um, so I want to talk about a, a few things from this interview. Mance did a lot of the talking as usual. Um, number one is Mance says, quote, we are primed for the next bull run, right? So he says, we're primed for the next bull run. And he says, that's all I'll say. So uh, whatever that means, we, the Hedera, as far as Mance is concerned, Hedera is primed for the next bull run. Um, Lehman mentions um, uh, the 687 um, transaction count. So this was a note I made watching the video that I thought was really interesting that spoke to Lehman's character. Um, Lehman was speaking on this interview and he was basically talking about, oh, it's amazing. Hedera is doing so many transactions now. Uh, we've grown so much. We're averaging a thousand transactions per second. And he says, let me check the transactions right now. And he checks it and he goes, oh, we're at uh, 687. So it just, it shows to me a guy that like can't tell a lie. Like most CEOs would be like, he wouldn't, he'd see that and he'd go, um, oh, I'm just looking for the number here. Anyways, moving on. We're doing, but he wouldn't mention that, but he, he did. So I, I thought that was an interesting point. Um, basically, uh, Mance is most proud of the, uh, community and the lack of rancor and staidness, um, which was weird. Like again, Mance, Mance feels so far removed from the community in a lot of ways, just cause it's like, um, it's not really in his wheelhouse, but Good to have credit. The community is a big part of that. Um, but I mean, it's like, man, they're so old school. Mantle Lehman are so old school. Like the community lacks a rancor and staidness that other communities have that I think makes our community good. It's like, what are you talking about? I don't know. Like who, like, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's a quirk. I think it's great. Um, and uh, the other thing too is, he noted he he Mance touched on the Google um, Council meeting that was in person. If folks recall, earlier this year the Governing Council met at Google Cloud's headquarters um, in person, and Mance said there was a hundred participants, and that he didn't really participate. Like he's on the Governing Council through Swirls, like and Swirls Labs is on the Governing Council and all that kind of stuff, and but he said the governance that took place. Um, at that meeting, he's like, it's, it's got its own momentum. Right. Um, and there was several days of, he said like several days of governing. Um, he said it was surreal to see unfold and people send the best of the best of the industry to show up for Hedera. So I think he was kind of expressing, like, he couldn't believe that all of these massive companies would send their best people to um, California and do it for Hedera and just spend so much time. Like he, I, he genuinely seemed like surprised, um, which was cool. I mean, it's like, it is a big deal. You know what I mean? Um, he said that the, he, he also noted, Mance noted that the regulatory things they did early on, with his general counsel were vital. And when he says this, he means early, early, early on, like Mance and Lehman making some really key decisions early on with their, with their uh, general counsel um, legal. Uh, like he really, Mance and Lehman are really stressing the fact of what Hedera did early on was so important. Um, he says there are lots of reasons not to go the way we took. Um, just in a kind of a self-reflection is like Matt's basically saying there's a lot of reasons not to do the things, not to do things the way we did them at Hedera. Um, he also says 
that they would reconsider some of the things they did in the last five years, but the white paper is still the roadmap they are pursuing. Uh, pursuing. He really says that we got it right in the white paper. And again, he, it's this kind of refusal to acknowledge any mistakes, which, you know, is fair, like a guy in Manson Lehman's position, it's fair that they would avoid speaking in that light. So I get it, but it would be interesting kind of to, you know, to see, you know, like, what would what, you mess up? It helps people. Um, he says, quote, we knew as crypto matured in the future, the early key decisions uh, we made for the project would become increasingly important. It's playing out exactly that way. So it's this it's this abundance of confidence Mance has, right? Where he says, we got it right in the white paper. A lot of these early decisions that we knew would be really important in years to come, things are playing out exactly that way. So it's this kind of really, really big confidence that Mance is having. Which again, I have no problem with, but, um, you know, we're in a bear market. Um, Lehman says that DRAC is about caring about the DLT community. They're addressing the frequent and intense pain points of digital asset recovery. So talking about um, Hedera's positioning, when you, have a com when you have a company like Swirls Labs on the governing council doing something like decentralized recovery, I'm not going to go into that, we don't have time. But when they're doing something like decentralized recovery that has such a broad, big impact on the industry, um, that's positioning for Hedera. That's big. Um, and it just kind of shows the character of Lehman. And I mean, that's going to be big. Uh, Mance says, it's taken us longer to get here than he anticipated. So for whatever reason, right, you could say the bear market, you could say all the crazy things that have happening, regulatory environments, yada, yada, yada. Mance admits that it's taken them longer to get here than they expected. Um, but at the same time, he says, this kind of this surprised me. He didn't know if we could, if they could do it at all. Like Mance, I think genuinely thought at one point that like, I don't know if we're going to be able to do this at all. At this stage though, the council is mature as the quote consequences of these decisions increase attendance of the council goes up. So, you know, he's still, he's, he expected it, this interview gave me the impression that Mance was talking about things that he kind of predicted that he expected, but that he's still kind of surprised by. And he said that it is a miracle. Like, and he said that as the consequences of decisions, uh, that the council makes goes up, the, the attendance goes up. So as the council is doing more and more important things, attendance continues to go up. So it's like, I, I found that I, I will give it to Mance that this was really revealing and, and interesting to know that there's kind of like this this weird dichotomy going on where on one hand there's a hyper confidence in the early decisions that Hedera made that he and Lehman made how and and um full comfortability in how things are playing out, but also saying I didn't even know if it would work. And the fact that it is working, it's a miracle. You know, it's it's very weird to have that confidence to know that this is how things are going to play out if they do. And I don't know if they're going to. So it's a very strange mental space to be in. Lehman says, quote, in the beginning, we set an overly ambitious caliber for council members. And we've exceeded that. It blew my mind. So... I remember in the early, early, early days of Hedera, like speculating on governing council members, you know, then you got Google, you got IBM. I really think that again, um, they, you know, they, they, they overdid it in a good way. Um, and, uh, this was probably the most important insight that I got from that interview. Mance says that the membership committee of the governing council reject, rejects lots of potential governing council members, right? So Mance says that they reject lots of people. And furthermore, um, he says, uh, where is it? He said something specific that I wanted to bring up. Uh, 
Where is it in my notes here? I gotta find it. There we go. Um, he says that um, when they left Hedera, they weren't certain the governing council would be able to carry the torch in the same way they did with that high standard required for a governing council member. When you've got people in the office, their peers, high level people saying, listen, guys, you have to get this governing council member. You have to have them. And these standards where at a time when they were desperate for governing council members need to say no, that must be really tough. And so Mance was worried that the governing council wouldn't take up that uh, approach. Um, and it turns out that they have. And I think that that's a reason why the rate of governing council members has slowed down in general. Mance says that they've actually taken that further. Um, so that, that was a very interesting insight. Um, and this was really interesting. This was, this was a, a little bit of a blurb that Mance said that I found fascinating. Mance said, quote, I talk to projects all the time trying to sell their solution into the market. And when they approach large companies, certainly publicly traded companies that have important standards and compliance requirements and concerns about crypto, when you approach them with a solution or idea that is built on top of DLT, they have this concern about the industry generally. And we all know that, right? Most people talk about that. It's understood that if you were to walk into an office of like a JP Morgan and say, hey, we got this amazing technology that can do everything you need it to do, it's a DLT. They're going to be like, no, no way. Um, and as we know, you know, JP Morgan is working on their own solution. Uh, but if you go into these companies, especially back then, it was a flat no. And what Mid said was, um, when projects, uh, when projects use Hedera because of that governing council, um, a box is checked. And he says, like, when when they're pitching it in the same way that other DLTs would to these enterprises and companies, and they and they get to that little hump, they mention the governing council, and because the governing council consists of that enterprise's peers and arguably competitors, it basically checks that box and there's no further conversation on that topic. Um, and they move forward with discussion. So man says that it can't be understated how much value the governing council brings um, in the enterprise world, um, which I didn't know was that extreme, right? That, that it was kind of a situation where you kind of flash the badge and people shut up. I didn't realize that. Um, and this was really interesting. Um, at the end of the interview, they were both asked, how do they envision the next five years of Hedera? And they said, a full, Mance says he expects a full council. He expects initial members will have rotated off of the council. He expects the majority of governing council members will have solutions deployed to full maturity. He also says financial, the, the, the platform Hedera will be financially sustainable in, and focused entirely on growth. And he says that this recent step function was a blip. So again, further exuding that confidence, Lehman says in the next five years, he feels the same as Mance, but furthermore, he says the network will have a lot more features. He says we will have sharding, all of the other node types. They would be at the forefront of an industry that has penetrated society um, right. So basically saying that in five years, the DLT technology space will have penetrated the wider society and Hedera will be right at the forefront of it. Regularity, regularity, clarity will have arrived and DLT will be understood by regular people. So that's a really interesting thing is DLT as a technology, very similar to the internet, the very basics of it and understanding of the value of it will be understood by regular people. He says things like, you know, operating systems like iOS and Android will have these technologies built right in. Um, so that's really interesting. And then Mance jokes, um, just as the interview adds, he says, in five years, you'll never lose your keys, right? Obviously referring to d -Rack. So in that interview, you kind of get a scope of how confident these guys are, but also arguably how maybe disconnected they might be from the community. So it's going to be interesting to see where that matches up. Um, but also willing to admit that, you know, some expectations they've had have fallen short. Some of those have exceeded. 
Um, and we did get a few new insights into regards to kind of like how they think, how the partnership between these two guys functions. You know, that, that was very interesting. It was a very interesting interview. I will say, you know, we, you know, it's, it's kind of the same vibe. There's not a lot of new earth shattering updates from Lehman and Mance right now. But a great interview nonetheless, and a fantastic interview. H Bar Bull, shout out. Um, great guy. Oh, so another week behind us and another week ahead. Uh, before I share my quick final thoughts for the week, a huge shout out to everyone listening live on Twitter Spaces right now. Another shout out to everyone listening to the recording on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And an extra shout out to all the supporters of the show. The contributions mean so much. Um, so this episode is called Millions and Billions. And it's just because it's all I see right now. Right? We see so many big numbers. And last year, do you know how many times I mentioned single digit numbers? Right? Like, oh, we've got eight TPS. Or I use the phrase couple dozen. Like, oh, we've got a couple dozen uh, you know, this or that, it's a very small, right? What's going on right now? 50 million in diamonds tokenized on Hedera. 100 million transactions per day. $500 million of, of uh, real-world assets tokenized by DLA Piper. 17 billion transactions. 16 billion pounds of tokenized assets from Aberdeen, a governing council member. Trillions in real estate being tokenized by Red Swan and DLA, uh, DLA Piper, a multi-trillion dollar carbon market uh, being built and access, made accessible by Tolem Earth and all these other different use cases we're talking about, a $1.8 billion market cap for Hedera, 20 million HBAR thrown into account, 800, and a 2.5% staking rate. Wah, wah. Well, big numbers, right? Uh, there's a lot going on. There's big news. There's big stuff. Big things are happening. Uh, the only thing that isn't getting bigger right now is H bar price. Um, we did a little bit today. I mean, we're up 12% today. We were talking about it. Very, very exciting. But I do think that a lot of people still look at that H bar chart and they look at that 50 cent H bar, right? 50 cent H bar. It was wild, right? Can we touch six cents? Can we make another big number, right? Millions and billions and zillions and gazillions. And that's a wrap for Hashgraph News and Rumors episode 86, broadcast live on Twitter Spaces every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and made available on all major podcast platforms, including uh, uh, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff, uh, the following Monday. Also, to shout out, um, if you've got news or insights or knowledge or tidbits, or you want me to talk about something on the show, you can email news at itsbrandond.com and send me stuff. Um, I want to do email because Twitter's tough. I want people to be able to add attachments, have a conversation with me, I get a lot of info from Twitter. It's great, but there's a lot of spam there. Or sorry, not Twitter, X. God, I need to start figuring that out. I get a lot of info, but email would be cool. I'm not going to publish the email address because that'll invite more spam, but news at itsbrandond.com. That is the email address to send updates to. Um, I know there's a lot of people that have stories from within the community, initiatives, all sorts of different things. Um, so check it out, dive in, send me an email. See, it's, uh, it's easier than you think. Um, if you'd like to become a supporter of the show, you can send an HBAR contribution to enthusiast.hbar using your Hedera wallet. The show's full Hedera address is in the podcast show notes, YouTube description, the mega thread up in the jumbotron support the show. I appreciate it. Even a few bucks count. And like I said, fun memos are appreciated. Get all the info you need about the show at itsbrandond.com slash hbar. I'll see you next Sunday. And as usual, for everyone listening live now, 
Um, if you see someone listening, their profile picture, and you don't recognize it, tap on it, send them a DM, say hello. You got something in common. You're listening to my show. Um, also, if you see someone that you already know, maybe you haven't talked to them in a while, shoot them a DM right now. You can tap their profile picture on the Twitter sp on the X spaces here. Send them a direct message. Ask them what's going on. I guarantee you they got something new going on. So make sure to do that. But with that, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I love you people. This is one of my favorite things to do. Hello, future. Goodbye, past.